Oh my goodness. I think we're live. <laughs> well, welcome right now to uh, Leadership That Transforms. And so let's see. Here we go. I know that I have created. Uh, huh. I wonder if I still have that. Uh -huh. All right, Ron and Real. I'm just kind of waiting for everybody to get on. Uh, we'll have a few people coming on. So, in the meantime, uh, let me just type in here. And here we are. And so we are coming live here. Leadership that transforms. And today we're going to actually be talking about the Torah portion. And that is going to be Chaye Sera. Chaye Sera. Let me write that down. And that is going to be Chaye Sarah. And uh, actually, that means the life of Sarah, Chaye Sarah. And um, we're going to be discussing it from, of course, Rabbi uh, Jonathan Sachs of Blessed Memory, his uh, new book. And so I'm going to, if you just give me one minute here. I am going to, let's see here. All right. I'm going to get you some passages here. Okay, there we go. It's going to be uh, Genesis um, 23 through... Uh, Chapter 23 through chapter 25, verse 18. So that's kind of the extent of this chapter. Although for us, we will not be uh, looking at all of this. We're going to look at some very specific aspects of this particular chapter. Uh, oh, I'll, all right. Hold on there. Uh, ta -ta -ta. Let's see. Let me go to my groups. <laughs> so funny. Uh, let me go here. Let me go to my groups. And here we go. And okay. Um, All right, I should have a way to get people in. Membership pending. Let's see what I got here. Um, okay. Okay. All right. Hold on a minute. While well, everybody's here, let me go over here into Facebook and let me see because I have somebody who wants to come in. Oh, I have to tell you, everybody, this is for me. I'll just the changes that have there we go beth you are now approved all right there we go beth is in okay so if you want to turn uh we're going to get started and uh let me make sure that i have the uh comments are on all right so i am definitely going to uh okay let me put this on um, our group here. Okay, here we go. Oh. Here we go. 
I believe. <laughs> That's right. And uh, let me go into the comment section. Uh, here is the link for comments. I believe. I believe. All right. Although I think that's probably the same. Ah, <laughs> oh, you're in. Okay, we should be having comments. Yay! Hey, Beth. Hi, everybody. Great to see you. Look at that. We can put your comments right here. There you are, Beth. Good to see you. And uh, it is just so wonderful to have everybody. Denise uh, gave us a like. So, all right, we're going to get started straight away. Um, so this is our fourth week. We're dealing with uh, the Torah portion, Chaye Sarah. Just to give you an overview of this portion, by the way, uh, this portion deals with the death of Sarah. And it's an extremely, to me, an extremely interesting portion uh, because of some of the things we're going to be talking about in just a minute, uh, do, dealing with the promises and what it actually takes to bring a promise to pass. And for many uh, uh, of you that, <laughs> excuse me, just one minute. <laughs> You know, when you're on screen, you're looking this way. I hate to interrupt myself, but all of a sudden you see these hairs that are sticking up and you're like, oh, I got to fix that. All right. So um, so we're going to deal with how God actually brings a promise to pass, which I think many people will find to be quite shocking, uh, unlike and completely erroneous to what they've understood for many, many years. People have been told, just pray, 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 and in time, in due time, God will bring it to pass. However, there's another component, and that component is you. And so we're going to talk about that because a lot of people question, they feel horrible. Why hasn't God answered my prayers? Why hasn't he brought promises together for me? Well, we're going to take a look at Abraham and we're going to talk about that. Now, um, in addition to that, this is uh, the chapter that's all about uh, uh, Abraham sending uh, Eliezer to get a wife for Yitzchak, which is Rebecca. And then in addition to that, this is about at 139 years old, uh, Abraham taking another wife, Keturah, and having another whole set of sons and sending them off to the east. And uh, as you have heard me say, uh, very much it is believed that the brothers that are in the UA UAE and Bahrain, these are the brothers. All right, two yeats cock, the half brothers that are coming home. Uh, and there is even a, a, some very, very interesting discussion around Ishmael, which we'll talk about when we talk uh, more about passages regarding Ishmael. Ishmael is in this passage. He's in this passage because he uh, helps to bury his mother and his father. So he's there for the burial. All right, now. With that said, uh, we are going to begin, and I'm actually going to turn on my screen from behind me, and I'm going to give you some, uh, I'm going to turn that on, I hope. Yeah, here we are. Okay. I can have it on before the, the show, but the problem is it just goes off because we don't use it. <laughs> So I might as well just wait here and start it here. And then I will be able to bring you up. And so feel free uh, to ask questions uh, as we go along. If you have questions, I'll also ask you some questions as we go along. And here we go. All right. Uh, some Hebrew today. 
here we go. All right, so um, we start out uh, this particular Torah portion. As I said, uh, it starts out actually, Vahiye Achei Sera Me'at. She dies, all right? And uh, she was actually Mea Shana Ve Esrim Shana Ve Sheva Shanim Shani Chaye Sera. It's very interesting how they present her age. She was 107. Tw and 27 years, all right? So the, all the time, it's Shana, Shana, Shana. So they say that Sarah was as beautiful at 127 as she was at 27. Um, the one thing about uh, Sarah that I'll bring out now, and then <laughs> we'll drop it. There's no, there's no real commentary on it anywhere. And that is the fact that she was alone when she died. Well, she might have had a servant or two. I'm sure she had her servants with her. But she was alone. Abraham wasn't there. And um, more than likely, she was found in Hebron because um, this was on the backside of the Akita. And uh, this was on the backside of the whole story of Abraham uh, uh, going to sacrifice Yitzchak on Mount Moriah. And uh, he didn't tell Sarah that he was going. So one possible uh, explanation for her death has to do with the fact that she uh, found out through the servants where Abraham took Yitzchak and of course, Ishmael, more than likely, according to the story, was probably one of the men that were with, excuse me. And so we find that, um, that this uh, um, probably more than likely uh, drove her. She saddled a camel, took her servants, and went after Abraham to try and stop him from offering Yitzhak and, and died in the process. So it appears she really dies all alone. And that's just a very, very sad, um, <laughs> you know, she has so many issues with Avraham through the years, even though she was a very faithful companion she has a lot of issues, and uh, you know he very often just puts her in very very awkward positions, and so she finally has a son with him that is a covenant son. Excuse me, I'm sorry that I'm yawning. I shouldn't be yawning. Sometimes that happens when I don't breathe enough. Um, so, so we really see that her life, all of the greatness of her life, uh, was done alone. And she died alone. No matter how you look at it, she really died alone. She died in Hebron. There was no land there. Uh, now... Um, there's another side of it. So there's that, that possibility. The other possibility is that they had a, Abraham was a very wealthy man and he had a home in Hebron. So they have found Abraham's palace. And it was the, it was almost like he had a second home. You know how you, you have second homes you, you know, especially if you live in a cold area you have a second home well Hebron was a huge trading area and it was in cl very close proximity to Jerusalem so he had a palace there and a lot of people think Abraham just lived in some tents with a bunch of animals Abraham was considered to be the wealthiest man in all of Canaan this man was not just a uh, 
a stranger sojourning through the land um, as a beggar. He was extremely wealthy, and God blessed him. He blessed him in you know in segments and periods of time. And you see this. The scriptures allude to these blessings. And so by the time he gets to 137 years old, uh, and that's how old he was when Sarah died. She was 127, he was 137. By the time he gets to this point in time in his life, he has established a, you know, a huge uh, commerce uh, trade, a commercial trade and uh, businesses and e-commerce. <laughs> That's not e-commerce, like internet commerce, all right? <laughs> That's e-commerce, like e economic commerce <laughs> for Abraham, right? Eternal commerce. <laughs> Abraham has kind of established all that. Uh, but he has this, uh, this palace, which they have discovered. Uh, and so she could have been there. And they could have started their journey from the point of, uh, of Hebron. Even though they didn't own any land, he could have had a, a, you know, his home there. And uh, in addition to that, uh, that would have been a closer journey for him and Yitzhak. And when she heard about it, she could have died right there uh, uh, alone. But she was already there. So, I mean, these are some of the possibilities, uh, but the scripture doesn't say, so we're not exactly sure. All right. So now coming to our lesson in leadership uh, by Rabbi Sachs of Blessed Memory. For those of you that aren't familiar, Rabbi Sachs passed away. Uh, it would be two Shabbats ago. And uh, um, we were already devoting these uh, Torah teachings to him every week in honor of his name. And now, of course, uh, we are continuing to devote them in honor of his name. So, great man. And uh, I'm going to go through this and I will uh, highlight some of the terms and words we're, we're just going to talk about. Um, he uh, quotes from a British newspaper, uh, the Times. They interviewed a prominent member of the Jewish community and a member of the House of Lords. And for uh, all practical purposes, we're going to call him Lord X. And on his 92nd birthday, the interviewer said, most people, when they reach their 92nd birthday, start thinking about slowing down. You seem to be speeding up. What is it? And the Lord acts, he replies, and he says, when you get to be 92, you start to see the door begin to close. And I have so much to do before the door closes that the older I get, the harder I work. And, you know, I think about this, um, too, in, in exactly the same way. I think the older I get, the more I realize how much I want to accomplish before Hashem takes me from this earth. And that means I don't want to slow down. I want to speed up. I mean, I think at the most retiring I want to do uh, is probably for a few weeks a year, uh, to go on a cruise or take a nice vacation somewhere. And that truly is about it. I don't have any desire to stop teaching Torah or to, um, you know, to move forward. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, scroll down, Janie. Or just uh, scroll down or hit the link. Okay. Janie is trying to get on. So, all right. Um, so, so anyways, this uh, gentleman, I can totally relate to that. And 
the reason that the story is even brought in is because this is Abraham. You do not see Abraham slowing down at all. Now we understand that he, he had all of his faculties. He, he had a lot of strength, just like Moshe Rabbeinu, just like Chalav. You know, when you look, it says he was as strong. And when he says, God, you know, give me my mountain, right? And he was in his 80s. And he was as strong as he was. His strength was not abated. Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, his strength was not abated. After all of this, he went into Egypt at the age of 80. All right. And that also takes us to something that uh, is really hinted at. And there is there are two ways to look at life when we get older. And the Torah looks uh, at age and aging very differently than society looks at age and aging. The Torah looks at age and aging as coming into your destiny. We think, oh my God, by the time I reach 80, half my life is over. I mean, I'm like, or, or even all my life is over. Like, I, I'm just going to be in a rocking chair. Well, you need to just get your act together. I apologize for what I'm about to say, but you need to start eating right. You need to get your act together. You don't need to be living with arthritis. You don't need to be living with all these autoimmune diseases. I hate to say it, but I have, it's not that I don't have sympathy and I don't care. Of course I do. I've created entire courses on how to live healthy. I want to live healthier because I want to live, but I am tired of people's excuses for being uh, not able to move when they reach 60 and 65. They look like they're 100. And I'm like, what is your problem? I don't have any empathy for this. You know, I, I, you have created a monster. You don't need to be like this. Your life is not over at 60. It's not over at 70. It's not over. I look at my father. He's 81. And my dad can run circles around 90% of all my friends that are my age. Why is that? Because he's, he lives life. And he takes care of himself. He does his exercises every day. They eat well. And they enjoy food, but they eat well. They take care of their bodies. My mother does. My father does. All right? And they go, go, go. And, uh, and I expect my dad to live to about 120. I really do. I expect it because of the way they take care of themselves. And if, you're, if your body is falling apart, you need to take action because you don't need to be like that at 60. I'm, I'm actually shocked at people that are falling apart at the age of 60. And it's a diet. It's lack of exercise. It's lack of, and in fact, it's interesting that uh, Diane's not on right now, but she'll be listening to this. And let me just see. Uh, okay. Um, uh, uh, you guys, just hold on one second, please. I have Janie. Let me find her. Are you okay? Um, okay. Um, are you a member? All right. Let's see. Yeah, it's right here. Uh, member and Janie. Just look at the uh, live with the, I'm, I'm, I'm holding, I am holding a coffee cup. Okay. All right, back we go. <laughs> I come back to you. Sorry about that. I have one, Janie. She's been texting me uh, several times today, so I don't want to leave her out. All right, everybody. So, you know, I just, you got to take care of yourself. And you have to, and that that is the next part. I think it, it's coming across and uh, so clear in this Torah portion regarding Abraham and Sarah 
that um, you, you have more to live for than yourself. And this, I think, is the next, um, the next part that you want to really, really consider that your life is, uh, has a much greater purpose than uh, just looking at retirement right? You have a purpose, you have a destiny. And so you need to, you need to need to be working towards that. And if anything happens, if you can retire at 65, and a lot of people aren't even going to be able to do that these days, because society in America has made it very difficult for people to uh, have the nest egg that they, uh, they need to retire. However, they can slow down. And uh, when you get to the age of 65 and you're looking at retirement uh, or you're looking at slowing down, what are you really looking at? What are you going to be doing? Where are you going to be going? And you really need to consider these things. And so, um, oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, JD, good. All right, so, um, you know, so this is really coming across with Abraham in this Torah portion. And that is the fact that he's not done. In fact, when, after he mourns the death of Sarah, what does Abraham do? Abraham actually goes into elaborate negotiations with the uh, community of Het. And this is, uh, these are the Hittites. They are the ones that own the land in Hebron. This is Kiryat Arba. This is the area of the, you know, the giants, all right? The, the four uh, giants and sons of the, the Hittite uh, leader. Uh, well, the Hittite three sons, I believe, and plus him. And so um, we find that in Genesis 23 and 4, and we can look at that. 23 and 4, and this is what it reads. It reads here uh, that Abraham rose up before his dead, before Sarah, and spoke unto the children of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you, that I may bury the dead out of my sight. Now, before I even go into this elaborate negotiation that is about to take place, uh, let me talk about the Jewish idea of, of uh, burial. Highly contended in the Christian world, contested, I mean, but uh, it is at sore. It is truly, truly forbidden in the Orthodox or uh, Jewish circles that practice the Torah. It is forbidden to cremate. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for this, and I get the stupidest, and I'm I, I'm really kind of tired, <laughs> so I don't have a lot of patience tonight for stupid stuff. <laughs> that stupid stuff in my own life, I don't have any patience for. It. I just don't have it. But I get the stupidest. You know, if somebody says there's no stupid question. Well, I don't. I disagree with that. I think that's a stupid statement myself. I'm really on a roll with stupid, aren't I? <laughs> I really do. I think that is so stupid. Okay. Um, so that's a you know a stupid question is usually a question where nobody is paying attention. And then they ask a question that's already been answered 20 times. Or it's a question that is not even relevant to the topic. And so people will tell me this. There is no stupid question. Those are the people that believe in tolerance, you know, until your brains fell out, you fall out. And so I, <laughs> I yeah, I'm just telling you, it's like we should be putting that on a raw and real show. <laughs> because I'm like, really? All right. I, I even ask stupid questions. And sometimes after I ask them, I think, now that was a stupid question. Well, coming back to this issue of burial, people will say to me, if I say cremation, before they even, we even discuss the subject, they'll say, but people die and 
airplanes that they blow up and <laughs> you know uh, are they going to heaven you know because they burnt up in the sky or what about you know in that the the, the most serious uh folly of that question will come if somebody asks about the Holocaust and the fires of the Holocaust. That's not the issue. Burial is not about, uh, burial is not about whether somebody uh, is going to go to heaven if they burn in a fire. Because cremation is not about that. Remember, cremation is a way to take care of a body when it dies. I'm not talking about or even equating under any circumstance cremation to some kind of catastrophic accident, whether it's an airplane, whether it's a volcano, whether it is a house fire where somebody dies and they burn alive or, it, or it burned to death in the house. I'm not, you cannot, you cannot equate eternal matters to things like this, okay, uh, you know, to these kind of catastrophic events, tragic, very, very tragic events that happen in life. What we're talking about here is burial of the dead. And why is it in, in Judaism and in the Torah specific, you know, the only place cremation exists in the Torah throughout the entirety of scripture is, is among the wicked. It never exists in the Jewish community, ever. When you see them offering their children to Moloch, right? Burning and throwing their children into the fire. This is idolatry. And so why is it that Jews do not cremate? Why is it that we do not uh, even consider cremation? And that is number one, because there is a deep respect for the person in the body. Why? Well, let's start with the very beginning of the creation story, chapter one. Because man is made in the image of God. People think that the body is insignificant and so much of Christianity teaches it. You know, whether you, and I'm, I'm, you know I'm not here to, to negate or bash or undo per se, but I am here to set the record straight on some very erroneous teachings. And um, in that, through the years, down through Catholicism, the doctrines of Catholicism, there have been teachings that have gotten interwoven into, into all sects of Christendom and even into some sects of Judaism, all right? And so when we look at cremation, all right, cremation is predominant in uh, Buddhism. Hinduism, all right? Creation is predominant in idolatry or idolatrous sex, all right? And it's becoming very, very predominant in the Christian world because there is no respect for the body. It's obvious. Just take a look at how people dress. They have no respect for their body. When you dress immodestly, you do not respect yourself. Respect means that you understand that your body is the temple of the living God. It is a mishkan of its own because God desires to dwell with us and in us. It is a mishkan. It is holy. And in Jewish, in Judaism, we understand it's holy. It deserves respect, whether it's alive or it's dead. Plus, God says, you know, and he shares with us and teaches us that uh, we came from the dust 
we're going to go back to the dust. So a Jewish burial is very interesting. If you've never been part uh, or privy to see a Jewish burial, it's very, very interesting. Uh, it happens in 24 hours. There is no embalming, all right? And Joseph is an exception, <laughs> but there's no embalming. Uh, there is really no, uh, under almost all circumstances, the body, especially here in Israel, um, the, the grave is dug, the body is wrapped. It's, there's a very special procedure of washing and wrapping. It's wrapped in white, it's wrapped in its talus. And um, ugh, hold on, folks. We don't need YouTube behind us here. Okay. I'll turn it back on when we, if I write stuff. So, um, and then the body is put down to the ground, on the ground. <laughs> and, uh, and then it's covered, and then uh, a tombstone or uh, of that nature, uh, uh, a stone of memory is placed upon that, that area in which the body is laid. So there is, even in the washing, the way the body is taken care of, the prayers that are prayed, there is so much that is interwoven into this uh, procedure of burial. But all of it stems from the fact that, that the person who has just died is an extension and made in the image of God. And so... Um, the, uh, I don't even think, let's see. Um, yeah, in fact, I, I just happened to look down at my commentary uh, from the Chumash. And it says here, it says, this is the first reference in the Bible to burial. And the reverential concern with the patriarch shows to give honorable sepulcher to his dead has been a distinguishing feature among his descendants. Met mitzvah, met has to do with caring for the dead, right? Care of the unburied body of a friendless man takes precedence over all other commandments. Burial is the Jewish method of disposal of the dead. And there's uh, in Tactitus, his historical verse, uh, history verse 5, remarked upon the fact that Jews buried their dead instead of burning them. Cremation has always been repugnant to Jewish feeling and is at total variance with the law and custom of Israel. So um, uh, it's really... Um, it's really remarkable the traditions that exist uh, within Judaism, within Jewish culture, that are consistently in the category of uh, Kedushin, holiness. And so um, this, uh, this is where we begin. And so Abraham goes to immense lengths to make sure that his wife is going to have a proper burial. Now, what he begins to do now is he, he enters into this incredible negotiation with the Hittites. Now, the, the word heth, by the way, and, and, uh, and the root of it really has to do with with deception, deceit, defrauding, you know. Uh, so there's this whole line that runs underneath any of the ite nations, right? Well, with that said, uh, it's interesting to watch the negotiation that's going on here. So let me just, let's just kind of read over it very quickly. And it says here, um, Verse 5, And the children of Heth answered Abraham, saying unto him, Hear us, my lord. Thou art a mighty prince among us. In the choice of our sepulchres, bury the dead. None of us shall withhold from thee his sepulchre, 
but that thou mayest bury the dead. And Abraham rose up and he bowed down to the people of the land, even to the children of Heth. And he spoke with them, saying, If it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me, and entreat for me to Ephron the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he has, which is in the end of the field. For the full price, let him give it to me in the midst of you for a possession of a burying place. Now Ephron was sitting in the midst of the children of Heth. Now, where is this taking place? This is actually at the gate of the city of Hebron. This is where all the judges, where everything takes place, right in the gate of the city. So everybody's gathered there, and Abraham is negotiating right there. And so Ephraim was sitting in the midst of the children of Heth. Ephron, the Hittite, answered Ephraim in the hearing of the children of Heth. And he said, even of all that went in at the gate of the city, saying, Nay, my lord, hear me, the field give I thee. And the cave that is therein, I give it to thee. In the presence of the sons of my people, give it I to thee. Bury thy dead. And Abraham bows down before the people of the land. And he spoke unto Ephron in the hearing of all the people. This thing was not done in a corner. And it says, but if you will, I pray, hear me. I will give the price of the field, take it of me, and I will bury my dead there. And Ephron answered Abraham, saying, My lord, hearken, uh, my lord, hearken unto me a piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between me and you? Bury your dead. And Abraham hearkened unto Ephron. And Abraham weighed to Ephron the silver, which he had named in the hearing of the children of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, current money with the merchant. Now, it is said that that 400 shekels was about 300 shekels more than the land was worth. All right. So he was paying highly inflated prices. All right. So the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, all right, which was before Mamre, the field of the cave, all right, which was therein, and all the trees that were there, all the border, everything that was around it, were made sure. Unto Abraham for a possession in the presence of the children of Het before all that went into the gate of the city. And after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And the field and the cave that is therein were made sure unto Abraham for a possession of a burying place by the children of Heth. So this is a huge undertaking. But there was so much more involved here than meets the eye. First of all, it teaches you a lot about Middle Eastern negotiations. All right. People think just like in America, you know, okay, buy and sell. It never works that way. Even here, it actually is a back and forth exchange. And uh, in the end, Abraham was doing something very, very important and in purchasing that land. So we find that Heth is going to offer it, but this is the way they also negotiated, as I just said. All right? So he could have buried Sarah anywhere, but he was determined to bury her in this place. Now, I'm going to read to you the commentary here. The purchase of the cave of Machpelah is evidently a highly significant event because it is recorded in great detail 
and highly legal terminology, not just here, but three times subsequently in Genesis. So it is in 2317, which is what we just read, 259, 4930, and 5013. In each one of these places in Genesis, this story is um, uh, reiterated. And, you know, we've said it before, but anytime you see something in a lot of detail in the scripture, because it just doesn't exist for most situations, legal, and if you see that it is repeated, okay, you need to take note because there is a real, not only a, uh, an understanding there, but there are principles. There are things God is wanting to reveal. And so, and it's not just the burial of Sarah, okay? So here we are. So God is hinting. He's doing a remez. He's hinting at something. And so otherwise, he wouldn't be mentioning, as I mentioned, okay? So let's take a look at this. Let's kind of break this down a little bit. So immediately after the story of the land purchase, we read that Abraham was old, well advanced in years. And God had blessed Abraham with everything. That is Genesis 24.1. Now, if you're reading somebody's life story, wouldn't you think what you're saying right now <laughs> is like writing his eulogy, like the end of his days? And yet, it was not. So here, even though this sounds like it's the end of Abraham's life, we find that he actually steps into a new course of action. This is a transition for Abraham. He begins to launch a brand new initiative. So he goes to Eliezer and says, okay, let's go find Isaac a wife. All right. So interesting that instead of, you know, saying, okay, it's all over. Sarah's gone. Abraham gets to work. What is Abraham doing? Well, let's go on. So Abraham gets to work, and he actually says, uh, Isaac, what is about 37 right now, and Abraham's not going to leave anything to chance. He puts in motion a promise. The promise was not only for a son, but it was for sons. Now, he cannot have a progeny if Isaac is not married. So he's actually putting in part two of the promise God gave him about being the father of many nations, about being the father of many sons, and the father of the covenant. The covenant is going to have to be passed down. And if he does not have grandchildren, he's not going to have it. Because it wasn't coming through Ishmael. It wasn't coming through these half-sons. It was coming through Yitzchak. And so here, uh, he now puts in motion everything that needs to take place to get Isaac a wife. And so um, he understands that for Isaac to have the right wife, he's going to have to send Eliezer back to the family that was in uh, Tehran. I believe that was it. Tehran is where they died, so in that area. Okay. And so with the purchase of the field, this course of events is described in more detail than almost any other story in the Torah. So we have a tremendous amount of deal about the Machpelah cave. We're going to come back to that in a minute. 
But when it comes to Isaac's bride, I mean immense details. All right, every conversation is recorded. Now this is incredibly, con it's contrasting with, <laughs> immensely contrasting with the story we had just had in the last Torah portion, which is the Akita, right, the binding of Isaac, we find almost nothing is said, all right? So here, we don't know anything really about Abraham's thoughts, Isaac's feeling, everything is left unsaid during this trial, this 10th trial. But now, everything's being recorded. So that means this marriage, this act that Eliezer is partaking about, is extremely significant. And so something's happening, and they're going to tell us what it is. So um, we find that throughout the story of Abraham and Sarah, God keeps promising them two things. Number one, children. Number two, a land. I get very, very emotional over this. <laughs> I think I've cried like, I don't know, 10 times <laughs> in reading this whole thing. I, I mean, or at least, you know, tears well up in my eyes. Um, because here, all right, it says that uh, God tells Abraham, he says, I want you to rise, I want you to get up, and I want you to walk through the land. I want you to go through it, its lengths, its breadths, because I'm going to give it to you. That was early on when he came to Canaan. And so now here he is, all of these years later, and he had not seen any connection. He had walked through the land. He had prayed for the land. He had engaged in the land. He had uh, really been a father to the stranger in the land. He had taught monotheism in the land. And yet, he didn't own any of the land until now. So, this particular promise and, and, and command to go through the land and the promise of the land itself is repeated no less than seven times in Genesis. Then the promise of children is repeated no less than four times. So God has promised Abraham that he's going to be uh, great forever, right? And that his descendants were going to become a great nation. And they were going to be as many as the dust of the earth and the stars of the sky. And he will be a father of not only one nation, but also many. One covenant nation and then many nations. So those are the basically the the, the four major promises that it were attached to children. So when Sarah dies, think about this. Abraham doesn't have one inch of land that he can call his own. He has only one child, and Isaac's not even married, as I just mentioned. So neither of these promises have been fulfilled. One of them has been started, and that's Isaac, right? But not fulfilled. And so now what we're seeing is the details of the fulfillment of promise. You are looking at how God takes note when he's going to fulfill a promise. Now, the next thing you're going to note here is the fact 
that also a moral, you know, that, you know, we talk about the moral of the story is, but there is a moral to this story. And this is not just a fable. There's a moral here. In fact, the Torah slows down. It slows down the entire narrative. Because whenever you have a lot of detail, the narrative takes much longer to express. He doesn't want us to miss the point. And this is the point. And you need to write it down. And I should write it down. If I can bring us back to our... Let's see if I got it. Yep. Yeah. Bring us back. I'm going to write it down. All right. And that is... <sighs> come, come. Here we go. And the moral of the story and what God wants to portray in this story is that God, let me just take it, put it in black. God promises. But we have to act. That is truly what God is bringing about. Abraham had to act. It wasn't just going to happen. I walked through and recorded several major, major promises that God had given to me in my life. And I took note of my part of those promises. And there was never a promise that God did not fulfill. And many promises I still have outstanding. <laughs> Um, but there's never been a promise where I didn't have to act. And so um, I may share one or two of those, but uh, let me just move forward and, uh, you know, naturally they'll come out. But this uh, God promises, but we have to act. Take a look at what Abraham did. He bought the Machpelah cave. That was the first piece of land he purchased in the land. He bought it. He had a contract for it. And he bought the whole thing so future generations could be buried there and something could be built in that area. And so the likelihood of him building his palace after he bought the land on that particular area of land is, is huge, all right? Prior, than prior to. However, there are speculations on both sides. Now, the next thing is, God also gave him Yitzhak, but there wouldn't be children, as I just mentioned, unless Abraham acted. Because Isaac could not marry a Canaanite woman. He couldn't marry a woman of the land. So, um, to ensure those two promises were going to be fulfilled, Abraham acted. And so this was, all right, then this is the reason we have Jewish grandchildren today. <laughs> and we have many, many nations that are, uh, you know, partaking in the blessings of Abraham. Now, I want to read this phrase to you, and this is from uh, Rabbi uh, Sachs. And this is, despite all of the promises, God does not and will not do it 
alone. By the very act of self-limitation, and that is going to be the very next thing that I will discuss after I read this to you, and that is Sim Tsum. It's a term in Judaism. It's called, by the very act of self-limitation, through which he creates, that's God, God creates the space for human freedom. He gives us responsibility, and only by exercising it do we reach our full stature as human beings. God saved Noah from the flood, but Noah had to make the ark. He gave the land of Israel to the people of Israel, but they had to fight the battles. God gives us the strength to act, but we have to do the deed. What changes the world, what fulfills our destiny, is not what God does for us, but what we do for God. So, before I even go any further with that, I want to talk about this concept of tsimsum. It's powerful. And it has to do with something by Rabbi Luria hundreds of years ago. He came up with, um, I hope it's hundreds of years ago. <laughs> See, when Rabbi, Rabbi Luria... Hold on a minute. Let me just double check his date of his Rabbi Luria. Okay, here we are, Rabbi Sar. You know, I don't know what it is with Google. Okay, here he is. Rabbi Isaac Luria. Okay, he was from, yes, yeah, hundreds of years ago. I thought he was, but... Safed in 1534, he was born in Jerusalem, 1534, died in 1572 in Sfat. All right, so uh, he talks about this concept or creates this concept of tzimtzum. And I'm going to explain it in the way that it resonates with me because it's a little bit complicated. But I'm going to explain it in this way. That God is, first of all, there's two things about God we know. He's pure light. We know that he's omniscient. He's um, also omnipresent. He's everywhere. All right? It's what we know about God. So we also know that God can do anything he wants anywhere. He, he's... He, he has the capacity, even with, with his kingdom and the angelic kingdom, to, to do whatever he promises without us. However, he doesn't. And so the only way that God, or not the only way, again, this is an observation. This is a observation. All right. Although it's called, Luria created a, a, a whole doctrine, a whole teaching on this. It's brilliant. It's really brilliant. But it talks about here that the light, okay, that when God wants to create something in the earth, okay, he actually has to contract a part of himself. And so he has to make space. For what he wants to create and so when he brings forth a promise and he puts it into your life he actually has to contract a part of himself to give you the space and the freedom to actually act on the promise so I think that is just one small part of this insight. Because how many times have people ever said, where's God? Job says it, right? Where did he go? 
<laughs> you know, so, so many times, all of a sudden you've got this great manifestation, right, of, of God, his presence. You, you know, you feel internally that you've heard from God, you're impressed, you're, you, you are going to take hold of his word and you are going to see this promise come to pass. And then the next thing you know, you don't even know where God is. Like, where'd he go? <laughs> and, and, you know, you think about Job. He's like, okay, uh, he was on my right side. He was on my left. Where did he go, right? And I think everybody experiences that, that walks with God. And I think um, uh, you, you wonder, where is God? And I think when I begin to understand just in even the most basic form, the concept of tsum, this concept of contraction, then I, I started to understand that where God went is that he, he didn't step away. He actually removed a portion of himself from that equation so you could become part of the equation. And now he gives you the koach, the ability, the insight to actually act and take the steps that are needed to make that promise come to pass. And um, so I think there is such a validity to this, and we see this with Abraham. We really see it in several, several moments with Abraham where God, especially in the binding of Isaac, God asks of Abraham very specific things. And then all of a sudden, God really withdraws himself, and Abraham has to act. And so here again, we see this partnership so clear between Abraham and God, between the promise and the fulfillment, that without us or without you, the promise can't be fulfilled. That's your promise. This was Abraham's promise. And if he did not act, what if he just turned it over to Heth? What if he just buried Sarah anywhere? They, we never would have had a land. We never would have seen the fullness of this promise for the land of Israel. And so what if he didn't send Eleazar to get a wife? We never would have had children and a Jewish nation and covenants that extend to the whole world so that the glory of God can be manifest. So Abraham acts and he takes once again the leadership role necessary for creating the conditions through which God's purposes can be fulfilled. That statement alone, when it comes to leadership, leadership that transforms, leaders, all right? And again, when you think of leaders, you might think the president of the United States, but if you're a father right now or a mother, you're leading your children. You are leaders. And leaders, all right, they take the responsibility, and that is the word, to create conditions. So they have to create the conditions through which God and his purposes can be fulfilled. That's 
really sloppy grading, isn't it? <laughs> but this is leaders take responsibility to create the conditions through which God and his purposes can be fulfilled. They are not passive, but active, even in old age. Like Abraham and in our Torah portion, Chayisera, indeed the chapter immediately following the story of finding a wife for Isaac, to our surprise, we read that after Sarah's death, Abraham takes another wife and has eight more children. <laughs> that is kind of shocking. I always, I always just like marvel. <laughs> and, and what's also interesting is who's highlighted because those, those two that are highlighted are also in the book of Ezekiel. So they're playing a huge role on behalf of Israel in the end of days. So it says here, whatever else this tells us, and there are many interpretations, the most likely is that it explains how Abraham becomes the father of many nations. It certainly conveys the point that Abraham stayed young the way Moses stayed young. His eyes were undimmed and his natural energy unabated. Deuteronomy 34 and 7. Though action takes energy, it also gives energy. Now that's a, just such a powerful point. Action takes energy. But actually, it gives energy, which in turn allows us to make or take action. So it's very synergistic. And so um, the contrast here between Noah in his old age and Abraham in his old age is stark. Abraham declined in his old age. Abraham fulfills promise in his old age. And so I'll read the closing of Rabbi Sachs here. Perhaps, though, the most important point of this parasha is that large promises, a land, countless children, become real through small beginnings. Leaders begin with an envisioned future, but they also know that there is a long journey between here and there. We can only reach it one act at a time, one day at a time. There is no miraculous shortcut, and if there were, it wouldn't help. To use a shortcut would culminate in an achievement like Jonah's gourd, which grew overnight and then died overnight. Abraham acquired only a single field and had just one son, who would continue the covenant. Yet he did not complain, and he died serene and satisfied. Because he had begun, because he had left future generations something on which to build. All great change is the work of one, more than one generation, and none of us will live to see the full fruit of our endeavors. Leaders see the destination, begin the journey, and leave behind them those who will continue it. That is enough to endow a life with immortality. And that is our lesson this week on Parshat Chai Sarah, Lessons in Leadership. And I think our greatest takeaway really is... Uh, the importance of responsibility, of taking action, and that is God promises, but we must act. So, do we have any questions? I don't know if anybody's still there. I think Beth, all right, stopped off for a minute. My grandmother was strongly against cremation, so sorry. <laughs> Ah. <sighs>
Yeah. Yeah. I've had to deal with this several times. I've been yelled at. <laughs> I have, uh, uh, in different settings, you know, uh, just posed the question and, and really taught from the sources that we have concerning uh, death and uh, burial. And people come back to me and they'll use the excuse of money. It's very expensive to bury. And, uh, and that may be the case. However, all right, um, it's like anything in life, all right? You need to prepare for it. You need to think about the things that are important and prepare for them. Don't leave it to chance. Abraham didn't leave it to chance. And I think these are just great takeaways for leaders and great takeaways for life. All right. So uh, thank you, uh, Denise. Just so you know, uh, the question was, your question is, Excellent. The rabbi is going to answer it. I've already mentioned the question, your question, but he is going to, um, what he's going to do, all right, is he's going to be talking about that uh, next week, I believe. So we're going to uh, highlight your question next week. Okay. All right. All right. So thank you, Janie. And Janie, the one from last week is also here. Okay, and uh, and then uh, hopefully uh, by the beginning of the year we'll we'll have this. I do have all this going into a uh, into the library, so uh, people will um, when we we're going to be starting a group, and so you'll be able to access it that way as a member. All right, so. Uh, thank you so much for joining me and everyone that watches this afterwards. Thank you very much. And uh, I will see you next week. We will, our Torah portion next week is going to be, I oh, that's what I was going to tell you. It, it, so this is a very, very uh, interesting Torah portion for me, Chai Sarah, because both my mother and my grandmother uh, um died in this Torah portion. I also have had uh, several of my uh, birthdays in this Torah portion, and the year that my mother died on my birthday, it was in the portion Chay Sarah. But here's the interesting thing about both my mother and my grandmother. My mother uh, died in 2003 on November 18th, and it was Cheshvan 23 the Hebrew day. And so when you look at life events, in if you're Jewish and you're in the Jewish world, everything goes according to the Hebrew calendar, not the Gregorian calendar. So it was Cheshvan 23 that my mother died. My grandmother died in 2005 on Thanksgiving Day. And uh, she died in the afternoon. So uh, it actually, she died, and it had already started uh, Cheshvan 23 here in Israel. So both my mother and my grandmother died on the same Hebrew day. So uh, it's absolutely remarkable. Yes, you were. Thank you, Beth. Thank you so much. You were with me. Uh, and it was just remarkable that both of them actually died on the same day. Uh, these are not coincidences. Uh, and we're looking into my other grandmother, too, because she also died in November, which was very interesting. My dad is looking into that exact day. And so I'm going to check on that as well, um, because I have a, a very interesting uh, thought on, on all of that. But uh, the, the whole concept of Chai Sarah, I hear you're talking about the death, but the whole chapter is about life. Sarah didn't die. She put in motion, literally, her death put in motion promise. 
And I don't know that we think about it that often like that, but because she died, Abraham had to buy the land. Check. Fulfillment, in the beginning of the fulfillment of the promise God makes for the land. Because she died, Abraham has to uh, replace her for a Yitzchak. And if anybody has a son, if you're a mother and you have a son, the attachment between a mother and son is so strong that it is very difficult for sons to take wives while the mother is still alive. <laughs> Even though they do, of course they do, you know, that it's difficult. <laughs> and Abraham knew right away he had to get a wife. So now Rebecca comes, fulfilling promise number two. And it says he brings Rebecca into the tent and he is comforted after the death of his mother. So now both promises are put in motion. And they are, the, the very first portions of these are fulfilled because Sarah dies. And that's why it's Chaye Sarah, the life of Sarah, not the death of Sarah. Because literally she brings life to the promise through her death. And so I look at both of my mother and my grandmother, all right, uh, their, their death, without question, put in motion uh, so many amazing things in our family. Uh, and definitely, it put both of all of that put in motion uh, my journey to, uh, to the land of Israel. So pretty, pretty cool stuff. All right, everybody, looking forward. Next week's Torah portion is Toledot, and that means these are the generations. So I know that we're going to have a great, great time next week. Uh, let me know. I know it's just uh, just a few of you at this point, uh, but several people do rewatch this. Uh, let me know if you uh, like this time. I'm, uh, I'm going to try... Uh, to move it to Saturdays, Saturday nights, but I find that uh, that uh, it's a little difficult. So <laughs> there you are. <laughs> How's it going with the family? Mm. 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 I'm so glad you made it. It's so good to see you. <laughs> All right, everybody, I do. We've been on for an hour and 23 minutes. I've been in three classes this morning, today. Three, three classes, major classes. The Enoam class tonight was amazing. So I'll be putting the link of, uh, <laughs> I'll be putting the, uh, the link from the Enoam in here, in Leadership That Transforms. It, and I'll also be putting a coffee with Kim. It was so phenomenal tonight. Uh, and that was the discussion of the Shabbat. And uh, really, really, uh, I, I believe it was transformative. So I'm really looking forward to next week as well. All right, everybody. It's been awesome. Yes, it always is. All right. Love you guys very much. And I will see you throughout the week. All right, everybody. <laughs> bye bye. God bless. How do I get out of here? I'm not in Zoom. I'm actually on the eCam. I can never figure out how I get out of here. All right. Ah, finish. Bye.